What is up and welcome back to Beyond the Arc with Brandon Silvers. There's really no time to waste today because I have a special guest with a crazy resume. So let's get to it. Basketball and track star at West Ashley High School right here in Charleston. Then she got a master's degree in public health as well as more degrees than a fever. Just graduated from MUSC Med School and starting her residency at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center in Maryland, a captain in the U.S. Army and founder of Catch the Beat Apparel Company, which is a clothing company with a cause. It is my honor to welcome Dr. Nadia Robinson. Nadia, what is going on? What's up? Heavy on the doctor, okay? Heavy on the doctor. <laughs> so, I mean, I read all that. We got a lot to discuss, clearly. Yes. But I need to know, take us back to the beginning. How did this start? You grew up in Maryville right here in Charleston, correct? Listen, Maryville. Uh, yes, I did grow up in Maryville, which is in West Ashley area of Charleston. Um grew up with a lot of my cousins and siblings, um, but basically grew up in a single parent home. My mother had five kids and she basically did it all on her own. So grew up struggling a bit. Um, you know, we've had those experiences where you got candles on, but it's not because you're trying to set the mood. <laughs> um, we have plenty of experiences where uh, you have to burn some fire, but it's not because uh, you want to roast some marshmallows. So definitely grew up difficult, um, but honestly was able to just persevere through it and staying faithful and just staying goal oriented is pretty much how I started to get here today. Amen to that. Shout out to mama as well. So you talked about how you were raised. At what point did sports come into the picture for you? Yes. Yeah, so you know how it is growing up in a predominantly black neighborhood. Everybody want to be Michael Jordan or Lisa Leslie. So I was Lisa Leslie in my spirit. I didn't have her height, but I had her spirit. Um, so, of course, uh, WNBA and Tamika Catchings off of Indiana Fever. She was one of my uh, heroes. Um was one of my goals. I wanted to play basically basketball. And so at the age of nine, I started at the city gym, which is in downtown Charleston. Um, rest in peace, Miss T. Uh, Miss T was the, she ran that entire program. And so at the age of nine, I started playing basketball and then got under coach Pooh, uh, which is Mrs. T's son. And we started playing AAU basketball probably around the age of 12 to a point where we got really, really good. Mm. Uh, to the point where we got recruited by just colleges while we were in while we were in the actual program. And so me and a whole of my friends, Maryville was playing on that team and some downtown girls. We decided to just go ahead and continue to pursue basketball as full as so we played AAU and we played high school ball uh, to the point where, of course, I got recognized to be in the peace uh, basketball team, which was a team that played overseas, but of course couldn't afford to play. So I didn't get an opportunity to go overseas, couldn't afford to travel. Um, but they ended up getting a lot of awards through basketball and it was a way of life for me. Basketball was like my outlet. So when anything was going wrong, I would just pick up a ball, go outside, shoot it. Sometimes it'd be so dark. Me and the homegirls would go out with a vehicle, turn the lights on in the front of the car and just light up the court and just shoot around just to get through. Um, any problems we had, we'd just talk it out on the court, leave it on the court and just go on about our day. So basketball actually pretty much just saved my life, kept me out the streets uh, as much as it could have and just kept me disciplined and doing something that I really wanted. So it was basketball was it for me. You and me both. So I told the people you were good. You're telling the people you were good. What was your game like? So I was a point guard. Um, the best position on the court, first of all, the smartest player on the court. I don't care what no one says. Uh, we run the court. So it was my first task in being a leader, which be, was being a point guard on um, all teams that I've played. And so my game was essentially I was a no-look passer, I was a crossover player, and I was a mid-range jump shooter. I got better 
um, as a three-pointer shooter as I got older for some reason. But at that time, I was a, a three-point shooter, a mid-ranger, and, um, of course, a beast of defense. I won uh, Defensive Player of the Year uh, my sophomore through senior year in college. I mean, in high school, excuse me, throughout the state of South Carolina. So defense was was my was my golden. And of course, me just having a lot of assists and being very quick, which is how I got into track, um, was really a big part of my my whole basketball game. And I've played with you, so I can vouch for all that, <laughs> particularly the defense. That's why when you said Tamika Catchings, like I was like, that's it right there, because she was a beast defensively. And that's really, I've seen you make grown men uncomfortable bringing the ball up the court. Because you were Listen, let's talk place. about... Let's talk about grown men uncomfortable. So me and your host here, uh, we played at Danny Jones one day, and it was me and him and a whole group of guys playing ball. And we were killing them. I mean, we were tearing them up. They were so upset that they called their homeboys in to play against us, lost to them. And then they got so mad that me and Ren had to leave the gym because they wanted to get violent with us. It was they wanted to get... They wanted to get gangster. They wanted to pull out weapons. It was like, we beat y'all that bad. So I've definitely been into some sticky situations with Brandon just playing ball uh, because you already may know, but Brandon has a sweet three, okay? Um, so Brandon has a jumper, and he, he used to dunk really good. I don't know. We getting kind of old now, but. I prefer to stay on the ground. <laughs> That's where God wants me. He used to get up there. So uh, we definitely had some just some basketball games um, where it was sometimes not safe for us to stay too long. Especially back then, that's when I was more reckless with my yes, mouth sir. in particular. <laughs> so uh, that did get us in some interesting situations. But we survived. We're here. We've grown, particularly me. I've grown as a person. Yes. Um, but... No, Nadia, the truth on the court, you mentioned, I mean, the quickness is the second thing that comes to mind. And you mentioned track and field. How did you get into track? Because you ran the 800, which I would say is the worst race in the history of track and field. It's definitely one of the hardest races because you got to do two laps around it. So after the first lap, you're like, dang, I got another one to go. Um, so for me, for track, I only did it to stay in shape for basketball. I didn't care about track. I never did track, never associated myself with track. Um, so my freshman year in high school, I ended up doing track because it was the off season. And when I first started, I thought I was a sprinter. So I did the 100, 200 trash i was trash okay i did not have those quick twitch fibers i was a slow twitch fiber type of girl and so my coach um coach sutton you know who's still a beast as a track coach who ran west ashley wildcats coach west ashley high school is my high school by the way and he ran that and we dominated all four years but he got me into the 800. And so the record my freshman year was two minutes and 26 seconds. And I was like, oh, I can't run that. I can't run that. And so my freshman year, I beat the the record in the actual school system. And so when I beat that record that day, Coach Walker, I was lit. I was like, yeah, Coach, I did that. He was like, you're still slow, though. That's a slow record. And all my real track runners know 226 and an open eight is trash. We're not judging nobody. But it's trash if you're going to be a true competitor. Um, and so I went to state every year, one regional every single year I was there. And um, my final year of state, when I was a senior, I broke the state record of running 214. And then when I ran track in college, uh, I qualified for Olympics with a 210 track time. But again, at that time, me and Brandon, we were reckless people. So I wouldn't live in my life towards the track level of greatness. Um, but at that time, as a as a sophomore in college, I could have went and tried to qualify actually for the Olympics um, to run the Open 8. But that was my calling. But track for me was, again, just a secondary thing. But I always say it's just to all athletes. I was actually more gifted in track than I was in basketball. But since I was so blind to the fact that I believe basketball was the only way 
I didn't give myself the opportunity to grow in another in another sport. So some people are great at both sports, but there's one sport that you are gifted in. And if it's, if it's not your passion or your love, still go for it. Um, because it could have been something that could have got me way more scholarships, could have got me way more exposure, and it could have got me just a whole different world. But what your calling is, is your calling. So it wasn't the path for me. Um, but don't let what you want to do and what you're gifted at determine where, where you should uh, follow your life, where your journey should go. Definitely keep an open mind. I think that is great advice. But you do have to have the passion behind it. And I know that running the 800 was not an easy <laughs> experience. I mean, running a 210-8, I can't even do that in my car. So <laughs> explain to me what that is like, the whole process, Nadia Robinson, the doctor, running the 800. The 800 is painful only at the start. So the 800 is always a rainbow start. It's always you and about 20 other girls on there. And if you're the fastest, you're always on the inside lane, which is always the best. But sometimes when you're at these big state meets, um, especially when I played, when I ran college track, when you're at these big events, you're not, on the out, you're not on the inside, you're on the outside. So after about 150 meters, you crash your way on the inside to the inside lane, bumping into everybody, all this foolishness. But at the start, it's the most nerve wracking point because you got your spikes on and you are waiting for this gun to go off so you can take off. But once you take off, you have to have a plan. So running is not really running. Like real track runners know you just can't run. You have to run with a plan. So that first 400, you have to go. It's not like you got, you got to put the, the gas on the pedal and you go. And so that first 400, you're trying to do it in 58, 57 seconds. You're trying to murder that first four. But then, you know, you get across that line and you're like, oh, well, there's still some girls behind me. I got to create some space because uh, no ma'am, no ham, no turkey. You're not about to pass me. And then secondly, that second lap, you're like, y'all Yo, about to be done. I got to take off. So once you hit that line for the second lap, you actually speed up. You you literally do speed up. And then you go around that first 200. Once you hit that second 200, after you get through that first straightaway, it's on and popping. You open up your stride. You continue to increase your speed. And then once you hit that last straightaway, you are a 100-meter, 200-meter sprinter in your brain. Okay? You are giving it all she's got. You don't care What's going on? You're breathing. You are kicking it in with everything you got to the point where once you hit across that line, you are about to collapse. That is how you run the open eight. You give it all she got on the first lap. That first 200, you speed up. That second curve, you open up that stride and that last straight away. Whatever's going on with you, it don't matter. You got to hit. You got to go all the way to the line. Don't let no girl walk you down ever. You go to that line. I cannot imagine. <laughs> you lost me at the first hundred. You got to get like, <laughs> but I will say, so you mentioned you did it to stay in shape for basketball. The, when my game went to the next level it was with coach Herbert Johnson, who was a track and field coach. Yes. And he would train me cardio wise as a four 800 runner. Like as I as though I was going to be running the 400 or the 800 and whew, that allowed me like you to pick up people full court defensively and then yes. give you buckets on the offensive end, too. So if you're a basketball yes. player, listen to this. You got a child playing basketball. Head on out to the track and get ready. Come on out there. Get ready. But do know that basketball shape and track shape are two very different shapes. Correct. Two very different shapes. Track will definitely help you with your endurance and speed, but basketball helps you with your agility and movement. Because track is just going around a circle. Basketball is being able to make cuts, being able to pivot quickly. So know that they're two very different shapes. So do both drills. So keep your endurance up and keep up your speed with track, but know that basketball conditioning is very different. Um, and it's still necessary in order for you to be very well versed in basketball. Correct. Completely agree with that. Like for me, doing the track stuff helped me be in shape enough to do the basketball stuff yes. and do that training. So you mentioned 
great at both sports. Were you recruited to go to college with both sports? I was recruited to go for both sports, but unfortunately, growing up the way I grew up, we didn't understand how to navigate the college. So for me, I had a mentor. Uh, her name was Miss Sandra Cannon. And I didn't know anything about SATs, honey. I didn't know anything about college applications, no nothing. I just happened to be a good student because I was just gifted in, in academics. Um, so we were recruited and these letters were coming, but we didn't understand them. And my mother didn't understand them. And so like, for instance, my senior year, when we went to state, I actually took the SATs at Spring Valley High School um, because my godmother set that up or my mentor, she set that up for me. So I didn't study for SATs. I just showed up. And so also I did not apply to college <laughs> until January, which was like the last minute to apply because I didn't know how to apply. Unfortunately, the guidance counselors didn't guide. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was recruited. There were a lot of letters that came to the house from various schools for both track and basketball, but I didn't, I didn't know. And um, I just happened to have got accepted into Fermi University on academics alone, purely on academics that I got um, recruited. So I did not get recruited for basketball or track from them, but I got recruited at various schools. And if I had taken the time to read those letters and understand what they meant and contacted those coaches, I would have probably been playing basketball and in college for a D1 program. But, you know, it, what you don't know, you don't know. No, because I was in the same situation where mm -hmm. no one in my immediate family had gone to a university, college, university like that. And so I just thought it was kind of like going to high school where I could just show up and sign up to go. And that would be that. And that turns out that severely limits your options. Yes. So it really get, does. Yeah. So, so you get to Furman and that's, that's where we initially met. Correct. Yeah, Furman. Because, now this is wild. If you know the West Ashley area, I grew up on the other side of Lenovar <laughs> and in West Ashley and Nadia grew up in Maryville did not meet in West Ashley. Did not meet in West Ashley. Met at Furman University. Two people I found out, I was like, damn, Nadia is from West Ashley. <laughs> and then bonded over basketball, as far as I can remember. It was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I don't like to talk about how long ago it was. It's so long. <laughs> what was that experience like? Because I know showing up to Furman, I had huge culture shock. Yes. Yes, I agree. The crazy thing also to hit back is Lenovar is where I did all my trick-or-treating. So I probably trick-or-treated at his mama house once or twice before uh, and didn't know. Didn't know. Didn't know. But yes, it was a culture shock. Um, Fermi University at that time was a school that was 3,000 strong. And um, everybody, or at least 90% of the campus, or 90% of the students stayed on campus because of the small university and the way they and the way the school was just set up. And so we stayed um, in Soho, which is the South housing. And um, on that housing was men, women, men, women. It was their first year doing co-ed housing. And on my floor, there were 20 rooms and there was only one black girl on that room besides me. And she was down on the other hall. But I didn't know her from a can of paint and she never stayed in her room. She just kept going back home. So I was surrounded by uh, white women every day, all day, who were of a different breed, I'll say, of white women, because people that go to Furman University are usually affluent people. If you don't know about Furman University, it's one of the most prestigious schools. One, okay, we have Vanderbilt and other schools, but it's one of the most prestigious schools in the South. It has also been ranked nationally every year in the best sciences. It's the most beautiful campus nationally every year is ranked on something. And so this school is private school as well. So when I went there, it was like 50 grand a year. It was too much. It was too much. We didn't yes. know better. We was, we was going where the money took us. Um, and so 
these people that were paying were paying out of their parents' pockets. So they didn't have Pell Grant like I did. Uh, um, they didn't need the, like, the need for assistance stuff. They were just paying out of their parents' pocket because their parents made too much. And the Black people, too. Not just the white people. The Black people on campus, too. And so out of the 3,000 Black people, I mean, out of 3,000 students, um, at that time, I want to say it was like 150 to 200 Black people. And of those 150 to 200 Black people, about 80% of us were athletes. A few of us were regular, regular academics, but about 80% of us were athletes. So, so culture shock. Uh, there was a lot of bias. Our first year on campus, and we're not dog confirming, but my first year on campus, uh, there was a noose hung in the student center. Um, they had a Confederate flag day where they made sure that the Confederate flags were placed on all the tables. Since we were a small group, there was a quote unquote black table at the school. Uh, where predominantly all the black people and the white athletes would sit. It was really an athlete table, but yeah. it was mostly black people. Um, and so they knew this was a black table, but they wanted to do their own thing. And so we had students um, from the Confederate History Club that just placed Confederate flags all over that table, and it created a huge issue within campus. So it was the first time I had seen even growing up in Charleston, you know people are racist, but it is what it is. But it was the first time I had seen racism like in your face, just stumped in your face, no cares, no worries. Administration didn't do anything about the news, but take it down. It was just a matter of just a lot of racism, but then just a different culture in regards to affluent Black people that were different because all skin folk and kin folk. So affluent Black people that were different from Black people from the hood like myself or affluent white people that had never had a black friend and that was a first person like i had braids when i came in that i had my hair uh straightened and they were like oh you cut your hair no i have braids in so just a lot of culture shock a lot of learning on my own and it was just it was rough the first couple of years i'm laughing because so west ashley i grew up in uh a trailer park so i didn't have no money either so being around people with money was wild and in charleston in like the style at the time was baggy jeans and jerseys yes. and i remember you mentioned like the difference between firm and black people and the black people in charleston like i remember we went to an event where Everyone was supposed to dress up. And I remember I got the picture. I'm going to post it. Showing up in a, in a giant San Antonio Spurs jersey. At the time, I was made, Oh, my gosh. I was like, uh, yep, Tony Parker jersey. I was Tony made, Parker's made, your twin, man. <laughs> I was like 110 pounds at the time. The jersey yes. was huge. The jeans yes. were huge. I thought I looked fantastic and I quickly realized how out of place I was. And it was just, I just remember I can still feel the wave of self-consciousness just within <laughs> me, just thinking back on it. Cause it was, I just, I'd never seen anything like it. I was like, damn, all these people dressed up like this, they look goofy. And then you keep seeing other people looking the same. You're like, Am I the one dressed incorrectly for this? I don't I don't understand. And to add some more context to what was going on racially on campus, that was the year Obama got elected, like first time. And yes. so this was shaking people at their core. And I assumed going in that Furman was going to be more like College of, College of Charleston simply because they both played in the same athletic conference. And it took me like no time to figure out that was not the case. Mm -mm. It was not the case. And I remember meeting Brandon in that Jersey because he had um, came over to our housing to visit someone. And I was like, oh, this is a brother. Okay, black man, what you doing over here? I'm waiting to see somebody black. Uh, so actually there were two black girls. One wasn't on my hall, she was a hall above me, my bad. So there were two black girls, so three of us total out of like 200 people in this hall. But um, saw him and I was like, okay, we got a black man. He got a jersey on, he must be, he must be one of me. Uh, then I found out, you from Chuck? Okay, you family. 
And after that, we were linked in. You, there's so many pictures of us just in the backseat of somebody's car. We didn't have no car. No. We didn't have no money. We didn't know how to get home. Um, I remember staying up there during fall break because I couldn't get home. Uh, I remember I had to work at McDonald's because my scholarships didn't cover because as Furman continued to progress in recklessness, their um, tuition got higher. And so the the scholarships I had, the hope in life, wouldn't cover it. And then I was reckless in the beginning. So I lost my scholarships because of my recklessness and just focusing more on the people and focusing more on how uncomfortable I was versus like keeping my focus on school. So that's the, also the important, just a little tidbit and why is it important when you go to college to be comfortable where you are and to be comfortable in the space in which you exist and also have that diversity affairs resource. Because during those first two years of medical school, I was so uncomfortable and so out of place. I was walking around right with, wearing with Brandon with my little bell bottoms on, just knew I was somebody, um, just out of order. And I didn't have money for the nice. I have people like, yeah, I paid 100 for these jeans. Oh, no, man, I paid 17 for these just feeling out of place so that I let my work slip past me and let my grades like fall to the point where I lost scholarships. Um, and that's how I got into the army. But I, it was, it was just be comfortable in which colleges you choose to go to and ensure that that diversity that they have there, first of all, is active. And then second of all, that you link yourself and connect yourself with people that are like-minded, red, black, blue, or purple, but you can start with the black people if you're black, okay? Um, and, and and that will help you traverse what I wish I knew then that I know now, that I tell all the people I mentor now. Like, be comfortable in the college that you choose. Preach. Mm -hmm. And so speaking of, like, all these factors at play, because I had the culture shock going on personally, and then stuff at home I was focused on, too, mm -hmm. that was going on. And then also I was told to come walk on at Furman. And then I got to Furman and they said, we don't have any spots. And that was another thing I know we bonded over was trying to make the basketball teams oh. at Furman. How much so did that play into your overall recklessness? Listen, those were great days. Um, I remember me and Brandon would go to the from university gym after dark and be let in and turn the lights on and just shoot around and just like practice. We would just go up and down the court, me and him just practicing because we both were still gonna hold on this basketball life. We just knew it was our calling. So we were just like, we're gonna go for it. And those were nights where I was just motivated. I was like, yo, we can, if I can play basketball, I can get back. Because remember, basketball was my discipline. So without the sport of basketball, and I didn't do track initially at Furman, I had no discipline. <laughs> so I was just outside or just being gangster Nadia, just telling people, yo, whatever, whatever. I was doing me heavy, just like being Nadia from the Maryville not being the educated Nadia, just being Nadia straight from the streets. And so I had lacked discipline because my discipline was taken away from me. Um, but when I found you or when you, when we found each other and we ended up practicing, that's when like my goal towards basketball renewed. So I ended up being like their team manager, but the hood in me can maintain itself. Um, and so, because that was going to be my stepping stone in order to get on the basketball team, because I knew it could walk on. I knew I was better than some of the girls that were on the team. I'm not being cocky. I just knew I was better. Not even a maybe situation. I knew. And Furman had recruited me as well. So they knew. Um, but at the time, I was a team manager, and we were in Texas at a game. And, you know, those, those money major games. And the person I was with in the room had aggravated me so bad that I cussed her out. Why? Because I'm not here from the Ville. So I cussed her out and got back to the coach to kick me off of being the team uh, manager. And so when I tried out, I had a great tryout. I know I had a great tryout because all the girls were like, yo, you Ellen, you had that boom, bam, but he didn't let me on the team. 
he didn't let me on the team not because of my skill because that's how he reported it it wasn't a skill issue he said it was a attitude issue and he had based my tryout on something that happened months prior mm-hmm. one incident and so that's also why I move the way I move in this world, um, because people hold your past against you and don't look at what you're doing in the present to be better as a person. And so me being better as a person and me being a good basketball player, I should have made the team. This is not me being cocky. This is me being extremely honest. Any girl on that team would tell you the exact words I'm telling you. Uh, God was good and I know it. But he held my past. 19 year old experience with one person against me and it held me back and then they got a new coach and all the girls wanted me to retry it again but I had already gave up unfortunately on basketball I had already gave up because that had discouraged me so bad that I had decided that it it just wasn't it, this can't be what God has for me if this is what happens when I give my best practicing day and night with Brandon in the gym, getting on a team, doing something I do not want to do. I don't want to film no games, but I'm trying to get in. I try out, be smoted and still don't get an opportunity. So I got so discouraged that after that, I was done. I was like, Oh no, that's what for me. It was brutal. Cause we had very similar experiences in that regard. And I remember being a team manager solely to get the key to the gym so that we could go into the gym <laughs> yes. and work out. And when when Nadia says, like, we would get out the gym sometimes two, three o'clock in the morning, we would be in there mm-hmm. doing drills that late. And I want to talk about me, but don't tune out everybody because this ties into Nadia. So for me, that I spent the one year at Furman, it was the most educational year in the sense of how I want to be as a person but also the worst year in terms of behavior that I had. And I was just mean for no reason because I felt like the world had done me wrong. And I still can't even like, I don't keep in touch with anyone from Furman except for you because I'm ashamed of how I acted at Furman. And that taught (laughs) me a lot as far as like, Growth is important, but you can't experience growth at the expense of other people's well-being and peace. And you can't let emotions control you. And then I also learned just being in that not really culturally diverse environment, the difference between how I can move as a light skinned man versus how you can move as a dark skinned woman. Mm -hmm. It taught me all these things. Well, it planted the seeds. I didn't really show the growth until <laughs> a little bit later. For both of us. <laughs> yes. So it so it was a just a, a terrible year in terms of my behavior. And I left because I was like, I'm not putting up with this shit. Mm. You stayed. Mm. What was it within you that helped you stay and withstand all that? Because my ass, I was gone. <laughs> Ah, you know how it is, Brandon, when you are the only one in the family that can, quote unquote, save the family. Yeah. Or you're the only one that made it to college. And if you are to return home without anything, you are now a failure to the family. And so you carry a burden that's heavy that I still carry. Unfortunately, one day I grow up, but you carry a heavy burden on your back that you cannot lay that burden down because you have a mother that works every day, all day, that can't retire because she doesn't have the education to do it. She doesn't have the 401k to do it. So you, so when she gets retired, she still has to work. There are people you see now in hospitals and cafeterias and Walmarts that aren't working as older people, because they voluntarily do it, they do it because they got bills to pay because social security for them was trash. Um, And and they got health issues. And so their Medicare don't cover everything because everybody don't even take Medicare. So they, they have to work to survive. And I refuse to allow a woman that has worked her whole life, take care of four kids, five of us total on her own, 
um, gave me her last 400. I bankrupt my mama to get the firm and it was $400 to get in. You got it back at graduation, but you could not get in without the 400. I took her, she gave me her last 400 to get me into a school. Um, where I had no plans. I had no degree in pursuing of. I was there to figure out how to get on the basketball team. I had no degree, no goals, no nothing. My whole goal was to be in the NBA, become a, a millionaire. I didn't know WNBA and pay nobody no money at the time. But um to get to 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 make sure we say the family. So I stayed because I felt obligated. I felt like I had no option. But to stay, uh, because if I had left, I had no no other way to survive. I think I would just be back. I would be in the streets. I tell you mm. right now, I'd be in the streets doing what we're not supposed to do to make money. I promise you, I'm too smart not to do reckless things. So, in, in my mind, I think I always think in my mind I'd be the best drug dealer out there. But drug dealers always get caught, you know. <laughs> Saying, but my mind, I'd have been in the street selling drugs. I'm trying to tell you. Um, so I was like, there's no other option for me but to stay and figure this thing out. And um, that's why I stayed because I couldn't. I couldn't see another way forward. There was no other way but to go back to the hood and to do the same thing I grew up doing, which was struggling. I refused. I refused. And so it's one thing to stay at Furman. It's another thing to say, I'm going to use this to become a doctor. When yes. did the doctor passion come about? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so just like when I got into Furman, the only reason why I applied to Furman was because there was this boy in my class when I was in English that was like, I'm going to Furman. I was like, say this, I'm apply. He's smart. I'm going to do it. So again, we don't have no goals because you don't grow up with role models. You, you don't have, you just don't have goals outside of the hoop dreams, the rap dreams. That's it. Um, and so I was in my organic chemistry class and some girl was like, I'm going to do pre-med. And I was like, oh, what that is? Like, what's that? She was like, I'm doing pre-med. I want to be a doctor. I was like, oh, man, what kind of doctor? Because I didn't grow up going to doctors either because we had Medicaid. And so um, we did some dentist visits. But if we weren't sick, we would never go. Um, so I was like, what kind of doctor? She was like, I'm going to do I'm going to be a baby doctor. I was like, oh, I can deliver babies. I'm a good person. So that's when I decided to go down the track of pre-med. But honestly, the original goal of becoming an OBGYN. Um, and so that's when I finally chose a degree in my junior year. I was living my best life uh, to do biochemistry. And uh, that's what I graduated with from Furman. Um, but during that journey, just like when you don't have role models people please get a mentor in your life um you can get discouraged very quickly because there's no one to offset the words that are said to you so any advisors out there watch what you say to these babies um i had graduated with a 3.0 gpa not the best gpa for medical school but 3.4 is what they really want you at so i went bad but i went you in there could, you could see 3.4 from where you were sitting we could see it. And I had done research and, but there were opportunities presented to my white classmates that weren't presented to me. So they had done research since freshman year and sophomore year. They had gone to conferences and we were all the same degree. I had not been invited to do any research. I had not been any conferences. It went into my senior year where we were required to write a dissertation to graduate with a biochemistry degree that I ended up doing research. Um, but these pre-med courses and these pre-med opportunities, um, MCAT studying courses, they were provided to the white students, but not to the black students. There were only three biochemistry majors, two, bi two chemistry majors, one biology major that were black and we were all female. And we had none, none of us had been afforded the opportunity. Um, and so I talked to who our pre-med advisor was at the time, and it was my junior year which is almost too late to apply to medical school. Um, he told me I was not able to do it and that I should not apply and that I should look into doing uh, a master's in public health because that would fit me more um, than being a physician. And so I listened to him. 
because he had he he didn't have a degree in FD by the way, but he had a PhD. So I said, well, I got to listen to him. And so I ended up not applying for medical school my senior year of my junior or senior year of college and ended up applying for a master's in public health, um, which I got. And then at that point, I was told when I actually got full military that I didn't take my black behind to medical school. Um, nothing wrong with master's in public health, but it wasn't it wasn't my calling for me at all. And you mentioned, so you mentioned the military. So at what point did joining the army come into all of this? Oh, I told you I was broke. So uh, stuff got real. I had lost all of You got to get closer to the camera. I had <laughs> lost all my scholarships. <laughs> I had lost my scholarships um, for life and hope because you have to maintain the 3.0 GPA. I had got it when I graduated, but... My first, they took away from my first year. My first year, my GPA was like a 2.85 um, because I lived my best life. Not really. I was living my worst life, but I wouldn't study. Um, and so I lost my scholarships then. Then I was thinking I was going to get a scholarship for basketball. I didn't make the team. Then I ran track, ran track for a year. They said, as long as I did well, I would get a scholarship. I won almost every race. I probably, I placed in every single race. Of top three. Every race that year I placed, won most of my races. Um, but they did not offer the scholarship the following year, uh, which was my sophomore year. And I was like, oh, no, ma'am, no ham, no turkey. Like, I need that scholarship. So they were like, oh, we, we want to give it to you. You deserve it. But we had some incoming people that we had to give the money to. But I'm like, I'm winning these races. Ain't no problem. And so at that point, I had known. That's when I started working at McDonald's because I could not afford to pay for um, tuition and I couldn't go home and I didn't have anybody at home to help me. So one day, I don't know who told this man, but his name is Captain Anderson. He's probably retired now. He walked up on me at a track meet because I had already quit. I was like, this is my last one. I'm out of this thing. Y'all are tripping. Um, he was like, hey, I see you run good track. Yeah, I do. I do. He was like, why don't you try to join the military? No, nah, I play. I don't do the military. I'm ignorant. I, I, I cuss everybody named mama out. Ain't no point. And me tan up your arm. Uh, he was like, well, you know, if you join the ROTC program here, we'll offer you um, free tuition. I was like, yeah, I feel you on that. But <laughs> room and board costs too. And I can't afford room and board. And that's back in the day when you had to actually buy books. See, these babies now get the books online. They could download the PDF. Back in the day, you had to go into that bookstore and buy your books for school. And how much were they, Brandon? <sighs> these things were hundreds of dollars Come on. Each. each. And then you would sell them back at the end of the year and they would give you a $1.75 or something. It was just like, what? It was disrespectful. Has and the when information you them, gone bad? What? It was a robbery. And when you rented them, they were they were up like 60% of the price of a book. And so, and if you didn't turn your renter back on time, you didn't, it was a struggle. So I told them, listen, baby, these books cost, and it's I need to stay somewhere. I can't stay in my car because I had no car. So I can't stay nowhere. Man. This man, I don't know, he worked a miracle. He went back and he told somebody that told somebody that told somebody that gave me a scholarship that did not exist. So he gave me the ROTC scholarship that covered my tuition, which also gave me $1,200 each semester in books. And then he found a scholarship through the Army that covered my tuition and board. So I was 100% covered my junior and senior year. All I had to do was go to basic training. I said, sir, sign me up. So on August 19, 2019, I raised my right hand by myself in a room by myself. I didn't even tell my mama because there was no need to have a conversation. Um, telling them people I would join the military, went to basic that exact summer. My mama dropped me off cried at the airport with, with at me because she didn't know what was going on. And here I am. I had to get through. <laughs> I had to get through. And that, to me, that's what I always think of when I think of you. I'm like, 
Nadia is going to find a way. Okay. It does not matter what you put in front of her. Nadia is going to figure it out. So you join the military, you get the tuition covered. Thank the Lord, because that, that firm of tuition, like, whew, whew, it's still, they still talking to me about it. Um, <laughs> so you do that and you go and get the master's in public health. For free. For free. Come on, somebody, get your scholarships in, y'all. Stop playing around. And you finally, it comes to your attention. Hey, actually, you can't do this med school thing. So was it like, boom, all right, I'm going to med school right now. This is easy. It's over and done with. Or did the, the good Lord, the universe, whoever, put a couple more obstacles in Nadia's way? Hey, boy, anything that comes easy ain't good for you sometimes. Um, but I sure wish in hell it came easy. It did not um, because I navigated the world without help. I navigated it without mentors. I navigated the world without appropriate resources. So it took longer than it should have. Um, but we enjoyed the journey. So I actually, when I left my master's program, I decided to apply to medical school. I was like, man, my GPA is fire. Like I had a 3.8 GPA. Ain't nothing before, you know? So I was like, I'm fire. I just needed the discipline to get myself together. And so, but before you apply, I took the MCAT. I didn't know anything about Kaplan. I didn't know nothing about nothing. So I took the cap, the, the MCAT straight up, just like I took the SATs, bombed it. Didn't do well on it, trashed it. And so I was like, eh, hell, let me go ahead and get another degree. Um, so I could be a little bit more competitive. And so that's how I ended up in North Carolina at UNCG, where I got another degree in biology. Um, but during that time, I struggled so bad because, again, people don't understand once you get out of college or your master's program, you don't have no job. And so I had a biochemistry degree and a master's in public health degree, but I could not find a job. I was looking for jobs in epidemiology, looking for jobs in health administration, looking for jobs in hospital systems that need somebody with my degree. And I could not find a job. So when I can't find a job, what do I do? I go ahead and get another degree so I can figure some things out. Um, so I ended up doing North Carolina, UNCG in North Carolina. And during that time, I said, well, shoot, I'm going to just do nothing but science classes. So that's how I got the degree in biology, just to boost my resume. And at that time, North Carolina A&T had a Kaplan course so for free. So I ended up going to that Kaplan course and taking that Kaplan course. But I was such a punk at the time that I did not take the test. I said, I don't feel ready. Let me just whatever. So I ended up saying, I'm going to just go full-time military. I had, again, quit on medicine. I was like, I'm going to just go full-time military because uh, I wasn't encouraged by anyone to do it. And that there was just no, nobody I knew to call to help me because nobody I knew was a doctor. Nobody I knew was going through medical school. Nobody I knew. And the people that I knew that was going through it went reaching out to me. Um, so I ended up being a full-time military person for a year. Um, prior to that, I ended up, because I struggled so bad in North Carolina, I had like $1,000 in my bank account. I had 400 to pay in rent. I had 300 on my car note. I had no money. So I ended up deploying to Afghanistan. Somebody, again, these opportunities come to me. Uh, it was my unit, so you have a choice. And during that time, you were not required to deploy. They gave me an op they gave me a choice. Hey, Nadia, it's your unit. We're deploying. You want to go a while? I said, how much are you paying? I said, like, well, let me go. Because life is hard. And I was an out-of-state tuition girl. So I was paying $10,000 a semester for North Carolina. I mean, for UNCG, because I was out-of-state tuition. So I was like, I need to spend another year to get residency. And I need this GI Bill. So I went to Afghanistan, and that is when I met Dr. Shanette Davy, who is a orthopedic physician, um, um, which is basically the doctors that fix your knees when you tear your ACL up or your shoulders or your arms or whatever. So she encouraged me in Afghanistan. So it took me going all the way to Afghanistan to meet a stranger that happened to be a black female 
to be encouraged to go to medical school. She told me, I had told her my story and my client, and she was like, girl, but why not? I was like, man, these people don't want me, man. They ain't, they ain't trying to see me. She encouraged me to do it. We were on ghost teams with her, so she let me be on ghost teams, which are basically teams that follow special forces. Um, I worked in the Bagram Hospital as well. And, of course, I did a lot of missions on convoys where I saw soldiers get injured or civilians get injured. So medicine was then ingrained into my spirit. Like, yo, this is this is what I'm about. I'm not about to be driving these gun trucks for the rest of my life. Pow, pow, shoot them, shoot them. I need to get... I need to save some lives instead of take lives. So um, that is when I came back to North Carolina. I took the MCAT, got a great score. Applied the first year, did not get in. Um, they said that my MCAT needed to be higher. So I had the minimum you needed, which is 500. They wanted to be higher. I said, ain't no problem. Ain't no problem. Took that hole again. Um, got a 510. Ended up. Applying again, didn't change nothing. My application stayed the same, just a different score and got into MUSC. You apply in June. By the time November of that year came, I was in MUSC. Mm. Accepted and everything. And I remember the first time you took the MCAT, didn't you take it like immediately after you, like it was a short time after you got back from Afghanistan? I'm trying yes, to Lord. Yes, like, Lord. I feel like you showed up and then you took it. And there was other things going on in your life too, right? Yes. There's a lot going on, Lord. There's a lot going on in my life. Um, my grandmama had passed. There's a lot going on in my life. So we, but I, but I had, you know when somebody can let a light like, fire under you? And she lit a fire under me during that time. I had only been with that lady for like six days in the field of medicine before she went off of her unit. Um, but when I got back, I said, ain't no reason for me to have had all this conversation with this lady and I don't execute. Like a lot of people are analysis paralysis. And that's what I was. That's why I kept not applying or I kept like punking myself out of it because I was just analyzing all of these things. But sometimes you just got to go for it. Sometimes you just got to get it. And so when I got back, I knew, girl, study for that MCAT. Because like you said, even before that, before I went to Afghanistan, I became a certified pharmacy technician. So I took that test when I was at Fort Hood because I knew when I got back, I needed a, a, I needed a better check because a certified pharmacy technician could work in a hospital and make like $17, $18 an hour. And I needed that check because at CVS pharmacy, I was making nine and I was dying. Slowly. So, yes, before I went to Afghanistan, I took that test. As soon as I got back from Afghanistan, I took the MCAT. I ain't had time. And then I applied that following year. I had time. I got to do So you get in the MUSC. What is the feeling like when you get the news that you got in the MUSC after all this? And I was in Orlando, Florida, doing training with... Um, some HR personnel because I had to I switched over to civilian HR. Um, they give you a phone call. You know what I'm saying? So you get a smooth phone call, and on the phone call, you know, it's an MUSC, but you don't expect anything because I'm from Charleston, so it might be a doctor's appointment. I don't know. Um, that lady, her name is Dr. Lofley. Won't forget it. So Dr. Lofley called me, and she said. Congratulations, you have been accepted into the Medical University of South Carolina. I tore up that building, okay? I was yelling up and down. Those folks thought something was going on with me. People are running through the door. What's wrong, Catherine Robinson? What's wrong? Listen here. I'm leaving y'all. <laughs> gotta go. I'm out of here. Thank y'all for your time. Give me my plane. I'm getting out of here. No, I was so elated because... I graduated in 2012, I'm going to tell her age a little bit, and did not get into medical school until 2019. So from 2012 to 2019, I was in pursuit of medicine and in a way that was not the proper way to be in pursuit. I wasn't 100% in. But it wasn't until 2017 when I got back, from 2016 when I got back from Afghanistan, I was 100% in. And um, and you you know you read what you sow. So once I got in and, and stopped being a little punk and stopped letting people tell me what I can do for me, and you just 
have the faith and pray about it and make sure that like, if you want it to come to pass, you have to execute what you pray for. You can't just pray and, and hope God going to give it to you. You got to, you got to, you got to do what you got to do to, to help yourself along the way and allow him to bless you for all the works and deeds that you did along those seven years. So I appreciate the journey because anybody that's struggling to get into medical school, I can always tell them these pathways that exist, uh, that I wish I knew existed. There are, there are so many programs in South Carolina that have pipeline programs. MUSC is a pipeline program. If you don't get into MUSC the first year, you can apply to the Summit Institute. As long as you pass the MCAT, you get an interview, an automatic interview. And you can get in the following year. A lot of people in my school went through that. There is Drexel University has a pipeline program. Furman University has a pipeline program. University of South Carolina has a pipeline program to medical school. But Furman didn't know about this. They did, but they didn't share this information with people. Um, and if you don't have mentors or people that went through the process, you would never know. So there are so many programs that are out there that are advantageous to you. But if you don't have the resources or the knowledge, you go through seven years of putting in work, trying to make it there. Mm. But I mean, like you said, <laughs> I think that. If we, and we always try to give reasons to different things we go through. But I think that you went through that so that you would know all these avenues, because if I know one thing about you is that you're going to be the one to share that information with someone else. Absolutely. So I wish you didn't have to go through all that, but it's good you did because hey, you can share it. the information. So yeah. what was that? What was the experience like at med school for you? Did you enjoy Man. it? Like, was it, was it what you had imagined when you were thinking about, I'm going to go to med school? <laughs> med school was lit. Um, it's, I would let, I would let tell people it's easier. It's hard to get in than to get kicked out. How about that? It's harder to get in than it is to be kicked out. Um, because, and people don't know this, like if I, I did my four straight, but there are people in the med school right now that it took them five years or six years. Um, cause they'll re quote unquote recycle you or put you back where you failed. So it's harder to get in than to stay in. Now, but the work is gruesome. So it's more of, I say gruesome, that's such a hard term, but it's a lot. It is overwhelming. Um, we had students at that time that were, had to see CAPS, which is basically like um, therapy. Some students were suicidal. Some students got headaches, breakouts. So you go through a lot of just stress that you are not used to. Um, see, the good thing, me and Brandon have been under pressure our whole life, so we know how to handle some stress. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so that's why the journey is important. The journey is important because you can cope with things a lot differently um, than other young people that go through it and just don't know how to cope with some stress. Uh, they don't know how it feels not to be able to pay your bills and be behind on everything. So it is stressful because you get a lot of information at one time, but that's just the first two years. The first two years are the, the worst years because you're being PowerPoint by death. You're also in anatomy. You're also in the hospital. You're taking tests every six weeks. These tests are six to seven hours long. And then to get to third year, you have to take an eight hour exam, a board certification, just to say that you are competent in medicine. And it is the hardest, the hardest exam you'll ever take in medical school, hands down. And so a lot of people don't get past that step. And that's why they quote unquote re get recycled to the following year because it's the hardest test. Now, once you get to third and fourth year, you are no longer on someone else's schedule per se. Um, so third and fourth year is all clinical. So now you get to just see what it is to be a doctor. So now you're in OB, now you're in psych, now you're in surgery, now you're in internal medicine, pediatrics, you're in all the fields. And every day you get to show up to work and help real people. So that was the best part of medical school for me because as a black people, our learning style is actually very different than a majority of other races. We are more visual learners. We are more tactile learners. So we have to touch and see things to become better. And 
That's that's studied, y'all. It's not me coming out the side of my neck. That is that is <laughs> studied. Is not, you can look it up. Not a theory, yes. <laughs> that's not, not a theory I came up with. It is a true fact. Go ahead and look it up. Um, and so third and fourth year for majority of black students is where we excel. That's where we are best taught. That's how we are we best learn. That's how we get our best grades. So the testing in third and fourth year is so much easier than first and second because we see these patients and so those questions align with Mrs. Jones or Mrs. Smith. So, but overall throughout those four years, um, we had a tougher time because we had COVID enter into our second year. So 2020 came and so we had to do virtual courses, which was terrible for undisciplined people like myself uh, who went to class every day. And so to do virtual was very difficult because I ended up having to keep up on online classes, which is boring. So um, that was a difficult time, but if you gotta graduate, you gotta do what you gotta do. So you you keep pushing through. And so that's what I did, but we found time to have a good time. Second year wasn't the best just because COVID, we weren't going outside. But third year, uh, you know, we did a few events, but fourth year is your best year. So once you become a fourth year medical student, it don't matter what's going on in the world, you ain't doing nothing. You have passed all the requirements to become a, phys a MD because you take your step two at the beginning of your fourth year. The rest of fourth year, you have no exams. There's no tests. There's no exams. You just show up to these rotations. And I finished fourth year in April. No, in March. So I had two months to BS because I put all of my requirements up front because you're only required to do a certain amount of hours. And if you put it up front, you, you peaches and cream. So from March, March to May, hey, I was just minding my big day, doing me, starting a t-shirt brand, okay, doing me. So it's just a matter of um, getting through the first two years and, and just knowing that you don't know nothing, but everybody that goes to medical school don't know nothing about medicine. They don't know nothing about no medicine. Don't let these babies fool you. They, I don't care if they mama and daddy's a doctor, they ain't help no patients in the hospital. They ain't cut on nobody. They ain't check no vitals. They ain't did no IV. So everybody shows up trash. Okay, we all show up trash and we leave just a little bit better than trash. Because we got so much more time to learn from so many more patients and to get better. We're just smarter than we were when we came in. But there's so much more room for me to grow as a doctor in internal medicine and as a future cardiologist. So much more room. But I think medical school ain't bad. It's just tough. But it's not bad. So you showed the shirt. Oh, yeah. Hey, what's well. up? I got mine on as well. So let's let's talk about that. What? Yes. Um, yeah. Let, what in the world what? would possess you? Mm. To be like, okay, I'm going through med school. I'm about to graduate. Time to start a clothing company. Lord have mercy. So I at first thought I could change the world by doing real estate, as Brandon, as you know. Um, but I got burned so bad that I just, I couldn't do it no more. My spirit said, I don't like the fact that someone else is in so much more control of my experience. And I need that control because I'm reckless by nature. But so I need that control. So I wanted to, at the end of medical school, I was exposed to people. Again, resources and mentors will always come outside people. Make sure you come outside, you meet people, you learn new things. And so this young lady was telling me about, um, she was like, Nadia, don't you want to do rural medicine? I said, hell yeah, I want to do rural medicine. Like, I don't think rural people are given the best quality. And ain't nobody trying to drive 45 minutes to no dog on hospital. So I just, I said, I'm going to do rural medicine when I get back, be a rural cardiologist. And she was like, well, why don't you do mobile clinics? It's like, what? I do need to do some mobile clinics because I love telehealth and the government ain't ready for telehealth because they won't cover it the way they should. But telehealth will change the whole landscape of healthcare delivery in this country to make it more affordable and more accessible for all people, especially rural people. Because if you think about South Carolina, 70% of South Carolina is rural. Majority of the South is rural. A lot of people live in these big cities, but majority of the landscape in which we live upon in this, in this state alone is rural. So 
all your family members is out there and they don't have, they shouldn't have to drive to Charleston. They shouldn't have to drive from Ridgeville or Walterboro to Charleston, South Carolina, just to get some health care, especially if it's an emergency. And then if they got to take an ambulance there, you're talking about four to five grand for a ride on a U-Haul truck. And nobody got time for that. Nobody got time for that. So mobile clinics is what I wanted to start. And so I was like, well, I need to figure out a way to pay for it. And again, I can't just save up money for a mobile clinic. I want to provide people not just the mobile clinic. I want to be able to provide something tangible that they can say, hey, I supported this movement of Dr. Nadia Robinson creating mobile clinics in South Carolina, Walterboro to start first. And so T-shirt company came to my mind. It is something, A, I can easily control because it's my T-shirt. B, it is something that I can start off with with little funds, not little funds, but like a thousand dollars or less. I can start off with it. And C, I'm in control. So I control the content. I control the designs. I control who gets these things. I control it and initially. Because of course, once you get bigger, you need help. But initially, it is something that I can control that does not rely on nobody but me. So if I fail at this t-shirt company i only can blame me i can't put no blame on nobody else and i hate putting blame on other people because then i hold myself accountable for associating myself with that type of negative energy or that type of thing people being incompetent like so i'd rather it be all, all on me to fail and i'm okay with me failing all of my own so that's why i decided to start the t-shirt company because this t-shirt company is a movement where it's not even about the teachers. All of what your money does is it supplies community movements. So yes, the mobile clinic is the end goal, but what I'm doing now in July is supplying school supplies for a first grade classroom in Bells Elementary. Bells Elementary is in Ruffin, South Carolina. It is the most rural part of South Carolina. It is 63% minority. And the classroom is Ms. Kawhi Elliott, and she is the teacher of the year in Collinson County. Because Collinson County is the second largest county in the state of South Carolina because it covers not just Walterboro. It goes all the way to Ruffin, South Carolina. That's a whole, that's out of town. You out of town there. So this community is a community that has probably a small town living. The schooling has like 300 students. Um, and these parents, yeah, they're making money, but why not help their kids, especially these first grade classrooms, get through one year? And teachers every year don't get paid enough, A, because South Carolina just can't pass a bill to give these people raises. But B, they don't get paid enough, but they got to come out of their pocket to supply school supplies to these students that don't have it. Either their mama, can't, either their parents can't supply it or they just don't have enough for students. Um, so these are checkpoints that I want to make along the way. And I feel like a T-shirt company that can support first graders, that can support mobile clinics, that can support just communities is well worth the risk. And that's why during that fourth year where I had nothing to do, my idle mind thought about not just like being out of country, my idle mind thought about, well, how can I help black people? And real estate wasn't it for me, but an apparel company is, is what I came up with. And I'm happy I came up with it because my why is, is necessary in, in, in South Carolina. At, at the least. Yeah, I mean, I remember getting the phone call and you're like, <laughs> I got an idea. This is what it's going to be. Because you've been talking about mobile clinics, just health clinics for a while now. Ever. Yes. You were like, <laughs> I got it. And I remember thinking when you told me, I was like, damn, that sounds like it might work. Like, <laughs> this might be all right. And you just were like, Fast and Furious sent me a bunch of designs. You're like, what do you think of this? We, we, you had every, I think every black person to ever attend MUSC out for a photo shoot to throw the shirts. <laughs> I was like, Nadia is making it happen. A plan. And so I just couldn't believe that you would want to do more in addition to being a doctor 
Yeah. What what's really dry? Is is there anything else driving? Like why why the hell do you want to do more? Like you could just be a doctor and you would be doing more than enough right then. What made you think we got to help these people in these communities? We got to help black people in general deal with their health. I know I ordered my shirts. It came with uh, like a, a guide of things I need to be doing to lower my blood <laughs> yeah. pressure. You're yes. all on Instagram. Like what, what inspired you to go even further? Two, two reasons. So we'll start with the top reason, which is my mama and my grandmother, both of them. My grandmother struggled her whole life. And we did not have the health literacy in our family to help her with her diabetes, her high blood pressure, her Alzheimer's. And she ended up dying from heart disease and a sudden death. It was a quick death. And um, this was when I got back from Afghanistan. So it was, so I had not seen my grandmother from 2015 to the day she passed away. Cause I had been in Afghanistan. Then I went back to North Carolina and so it wasn't until her funeral or when she was in the hospital that I saw her. But during that time, there was no understanding of how to control any of her diseases that I know now. Another reason why I was like freaked out, I'm doing medicine, that I know now. And so like there are so many families like my family. And I don't judge my family. I don't knock my family. We just don't know what you don't know. You can't be mad at people for that. Um, but you can be mad at people that don't educate people when you have the knowledge or don't provide resources when you have the ability to do so. And so that's why the more exists because there's so many families and I'm just, I'm just biased towards black families. I'm, I apologize to everybody else. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to take care of everybody. I don't care who you are, but I'm telling you who I'm here for. And so there's so many black families that just have the same situation with their grandmama, with their mama, um, with their children. Because Juvenile diabetes is going up and up and up. And so my mom and my grandmother are why I make sure to do this. And I say my grandmother because of the lack of health literacy. I say my mama because I told you she can't retire. If I can make a million doing this thing, I'm going to do it. If like I can make 300 million, I'm going to do it because I refuse to allow my mother to live in poverty. I refuse to allow her not to be able to afford medications. Um, like my grandmama couldn't afford. I refuse to allow her to be stricken with sickness and can't get quality health care because she can't afford it. I refuse. So that's another reason why you, I do more because I only have one parent that had my back all the way through. And the, the least I could do is take care of her throughout the rest of her days on this earth. Um, so that's my first reason, those top two women. And my second reason is because somebody did it for me. We had in Maryville free school lunch programs. The, the church did school supplies. So when my mama couldn't afford school supplies, we went to that church, got a book bag, packed the school supplies. Um, the church did um, uniforms because I went to Stoner Park Elementary and we had to wear uniforms. So they gave us free uniforms. Those free events at those basketball courts where they put you on these basketball teams, you don't have to pay nothing. All you got to do is show up and get these babies off the street. Those after school programs that existed. So like they, it was done for me. And so why not ensure that these programs still exist for people that still need them, especially in the rural community where there ain't nothing to do but chill at a local McDonald's. I noticed, I'm not exaggerating. I worked in East Tennessee and it was rural. I worked there for two years and my master's program. And all those kids had to do was kick it at a Taco Bell or a McDonald's in their car. They had no place to go. And all you can do after that is either get pregnant, do some drugs or sell some drugs, baby. That's all you can do. So I say do more because yeah, I can practice medicine, but and I I affect those immediate patients. But what about the people that never can come to the hospital or that can't get there until they damn near day because they don't miss they blood pressure out of control, diabetes out of control. So you just trying to help them get over uh, and stabilize them. So why not is my question. 
And it don't make sense why not to do more because if you do more and you help just a few people, they're going to pay it forward and bless other people in their life. You just happen to be the seed that was planted. But I always say this to me and my friends, the seed you plant will never be a tree that you get to enjoy shade under. I will never see the seeds that I have planted, but the people that get to benefit from the shade, from the fruit that I planted years ago are who I'm here for anyway. So that was the two reasons, my mama and my grandmother, and then it was done for me. So there's no reason for me not to ensure that all my black people are supplied with enough medical education to take care of themselves and their friends and family. Spoken like a true point guard, assisting others <laughs> to this day. And an 800 meter runner, enduring everything in life. So that was that was my way of tying it back to sports. In case y'all couldn't tell, you're welcome. I'm very talented <laughs> at this. I got to know, because I was there at graduation. Oh. <laughs> when you get the diploma, you sit down, you open it up. You see your name on that degree. Your mama's up there cheering. Your grandmama's looking down, cheering. You went through all this to get that. Mm -hmm. What is going through your head? Vision blurry. That's what it was. <laughs> My vision got blurry. It was like, yo, let's just go ahead and open it and take a picture. I was like, yeah, let's do it. As soon as I open it and see my name and see that the this part of the journey has come to an end. I get teary-eyed and I get so elated because it's like, it's when you finally, all the work, all the struggle, all the pain. I remember when I passed my MCAT and called you and told you I had the 500 and blew up on the phone with you. Like all of that just comes together in that one moment and all you can do is just say, my God, you just thank God and you just be like, you did it. That's it. You did it. And nobody can take it from you. You damn sure did it. Did it. I'm here. <laughs> I witnessed it. You did it. So tell everyone, because I can't imagine why you wouldn't want to support now. Good Lord. <laughs> Tell everyone where we can find. I want to I want some more catch to beat apparel shirts. I Listen, want to I'm see getting up there. <laughs> you, you're getting the um the health tips and stuff. You putting it on social media. Where can we find all things to support catch to beat apparel? All things to support catch to beat apparel is at catch to beat apparel. C A T C H D A. A P P A R E L. So at Catch the Beat Apparel on Facebook and Instagram. Um, you can also just follow my personal Facebook page, Nadia Robinson, because I'm up on there too. Um, and then also for the website, it's catchthebeatapparel.com. D A, because we get you down. So we don't do T H around, T H E around here. So it's Catch the Beat. Oh, opposite way. Catch the beat apparel dot com. If you want to purchase a shirt, just know they're all um, majority of the proceeds goes towards the Bell's Elementary classroom for the months of from May to July. July 31st is when I will be delivering those school supplies to them. I plan on doing an Amazon wish list as well um, so that you, and I'll put it in my um link at some point where you guys can go in there if you want to just buy you want to buy a shirt no problem you can go ahead and buy some pencils for these babies some crayons for these kiddos a uh, crayon box or whatever and if you just want to support directly but also if you support me that money goes towards Bella's elementary and it also goes towards a pot towards the mobile clinic that I want to be able to create in the next six years I want to be able to say in 2029 that I have my first mobile clinic and we're going to be in Walterboro getting real egg net. Okay. So that's the plan. Mm. And all that information is going to be in the show notes. So <laughs> check it out. I'm going to have all the links to the social media. You need to be up on that. The website, I'm going to be on the website too. So yes. <laughs> I mean, anything else you want to shout out, plug anything. 
<laughs> um, definitely continue to support Beyond the Arc with Brandon Silvers. Um, he also has Above the Fold as well, which I like better. But um, they're both great. <laughs> I like the personal stuff, but I like yeah. them both. Uh, support his YouTube shorts and I continue to support him. I've known Brandon for over 15 years oh, or Lord. about 15 years. It's been a long time. I've known him as long as a teenager. So um, he's awesome. He's an awesome person. He is doing this also for the Black community. And when he talks about sports, I know he also talks about how it affects the Black community and also how we could just move forward in life. So he's had his struggles in life, too. And he has overcome. I promise you, we were both very reckless and young-minded growing up we just did not have it together but that's because we grew up similar um but we have grown and he has grown and i'm very proud of you brandon for mm -hmm. what you're doing here keep doing what you're doing you're gonna blow up it's all about consistency so thank you all for supporting me um shout out to eliza dennis and ruby frazier who are gone on the glory but both of them made sure i stayed into school and they're both my grandmothers so that is it and alberta dennis mama maryville yes no i appreciate that yeah i was looking at the pictures like i said i'm gonna post a picture you'll be able to see <laughs> my hair has switched places like i used to have <laughs> on the head and not on the face and now we just had to mm. reverse that real quick oh jesus um but no we've been talking about you coming on forever uh like you said i like the personal stuff too i felt like people need to hear your if you don't get inspired by nadia's story i don't know <laughs> you need to go see her and get your pulse checked if it's you don't get singing. inspired by her i mean come on so going <laughs> from west ashley high school sports legend to where you are today being able to watch that and not having you like like I said, me at Furman deserved to be thrown away, but you stuck with me. So I appreciate you for that. Um, no, that is, that's going to do it. I appreciate you coming mm -hmm. on. I thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right. That is another episode of Beyond the Art with Brandon Silvers. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, like, review, share, all that fun stuff. And I will catch y'all next week. <laughs> <laughs>